Will you turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Philippians chapter 3? We will be in verses 8 through 11 this morning. And as you are turning there, uh, I just want to mention to you that we all have preferences, don't we? We all have certain preferences that, that, uh, of things that we, we like. For instance, I prefer more vinegar-based barbecue sauces that are characteristic to Georgia and, and North Carolina than I do those thick, sweet sauces that you buy at the store, uh, Kraft or Casey Masterpiece or, or anything like that. Those are the things that I like. Uh, I prefer college football to professional football especially if you're talking about the Southeastern Conference and my beloved Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and sometimes, sometimes those, those preferences that we have aren't of any great consequence, are they? The two things I just mentioned, they're not of any great consequence, but, but sometimes we make them out to be more than what they should be, right? Uh, just ask anybody uh, who has a, a dog in the fight between Michigan and Michigan State, right? What their preference is, uh, they, they tend to think of it as more than what it really is. But there are moments when our preferences influence the choices uh, we make in less than optimal ways. Uh, for instance, if we allow our preference for a specific musical style to dictate all that we listen to and to degrade other types of music, then we stand to miss out on uh, some amazing and beautiful art that's being created often uh, to glorify God. Today, there's many musical styles that are being utilized to sing praises to the Lord, and while not all of them are my own personal preference, I can appreciate the fact that people are willing to, to sing to the Lord their praise and their worship in a style that, uh, that they like, uh, and, and one that brings unity to the body and, and joy to the believer. Catherine Booth, who with her late husband William uh, founded the Salvation Army, once said, there comes a crisis a moment when every human soul which enters the kingdom of God has to make its choice of that kingdom in preference to everything else it holds and owns. You know, Paul experienced just such a moment in his life as well, and our passage this morning reveals what his choice, what his preference was, and that was Christ above all else. And when we choose to elevate Christ above all else in our life, we experience unity within the body and an unmatchable joy. So this morning in our passage here in Philippians, we're going to see that as Paul, uh, his preference for Christ above all else, he, he rejects the world's righteousness, he receives Christ's righteousness, and he has a realization, an eager realization of the coming resurrection. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word? We're going to read verses 8 through 11 of chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. The apostle wrote to Philippi, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and for your grace that you give us so freely and so liberally. Father, I thank you for what we have been able to celebrate here. Father, I thank you for the celebration of, of new life like we had last week. I thank you for the celebration of reconciliation and restoration. Father, what an amazing thing that we have the privilege to, to celebrate with you over. 
Father, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that you open our hearts and minds to the truth that it contains. Help us to see the preference for unity and joy that we should have in our life, that we should set aside everything else that might come in the way of Jesus Christ in our lives to count them as rubbish in order that we might hold on to him, to gain him and be found in him so that we can be proclaimers of this gospel message to those who so desperately need to hear it. Father, we ask all of this in the name of him who makes it possible. Amen. Now, as we begin to study this passage here in Philippians, it's worthwhile to quickly review the immediate context in which Paul is writing. We saw last week that there was a peril to the unity and joy, and we saw that in verses 1 through 7 of this chapter, and that peril to unity and joy was the self-promotion of the Judaizers and the self-satisfaction of works Ultimately, what we're talking about in both of those cases is self-righteousness, self-righteousness. And and that's what Paul was warning them about. And so now what we find here is Paul saying that self-righteousness is essentially the world standard by which righteousness is measured. How much have you done How good are you? How much have you accumulated? That's the world's standards. And and in that previous passage, Paul said, I have all of those things in spades. If you think you have it, I have more. I I am perfect in this regard. Everything, whether it's my personal merits, whether it's my production, uh, my, my resume is impeccable here. And, and it's within this context that we come to understand the first point that we want to see this morning in our text, and that is Paul's rejection of worldly righteousness. He begins here in verse 8 by restating what he said in verse 7 and expanding on it. Look at what he says here. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered uh, the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, and then into verse 9, and be found in him. What Paul, when Paul says that he counts everything as loss, everything is loss, he's first saying all of those things that I listed in verses 4 through 6 just a few moments ago, everything that I said there, all of those personal uh, pedigree aspects, all of that production, all of my works, I count all that as loss. But he's expanding on that too. And he's saying it's not only do I count all those things as loss, I count everything as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. That's it. He's going to count everything that would have been considered as value to the world as loss. If there was anything in this world that could inspire confidence in the flesh, Paul says that's rubbish. Now, I don't want you to miss the strength of Paul's word choice here. This is strong language that Paul is using in this passage right here. The word in the Greek is skubalon, uh, for rubbish. And if you happen to have the King James Version, you'll see that it's actually translated there as dung, and, and that's what this word meant. It, it meant excrement or or refuse or kitchen scraps and essentially what Paul is trying to say here is he's trying to draw a comparison between all of these things that might come into uh, rivalry with Jesus Christ in our lives and he says I want to compare that to the most worthless debased thing that you can think of and that's what it's equivalent to so everything that you think might be of value is rubbish it is it is garbage it is it is the the worst thing that you can imagine so when it comes to our self righteousness all of those things that we do all of those those actions of our own the things that we think we're good enough or smart enough at paul says they equate exactly to nothing all of our self righteousness is rubbish 
But it's not just our self-righteousness that Paul wants us to see in this light. He's also counting all worldly standards as rubbish as well. Whatever measuring stick that the world wants to use to measure our self-worth, he says, uh, uh, if it's not Christ, it's worthless. And the world proposes many rivals to Jesus, doesn't it? Uh, you, you have religious status, you have societal status, you have your possessions, you have material wealth, your personal honor, a comfortable life, a model family, political power, all of these measuring sticks that the world has to, to measure your worth. And in response to each and every one of those, Paul would say, rubbish, you see, the world system and the ruler of that world system, the devil, he wants you to measure your self-worth by a faulty measure. He wants you to place your confidence in a faulty measure because he knows that it will distract you from God. It will come in between you and his word. It will come in between you and him. It, it will. Anything that we do apart from Christ. Let me give you an example of why a true measure, a true standard, is so important. In woodworking, if you're going to cut things, if you're going to make a bookcase, for example, you need to be able to cut things square. You need to cut them on 90-degree angles, all right? So if I'm going to build a new bookshelf for my office or, or for my home, I, I'm going to build a six-foot-tall bookcase. I need to be able to cut those sides and the shelves square. Now, let's say that I decided to go out and buy my tools on the cheap, okay? I went down and I got a cheap square, and it wasn't exactly 90 degrees, but it was close, right? It was only one degree off. That square, instead of being 90 degrees, was 89 degrees. That's close enough, right? That's close to square. I mean, one degree isn't enough to make a difference, is it? Yes, it is. Absolutely, and those of you who are woodworkers know that one degree is enough to make a huge difference. In fact, if I'm going to cut that six-foot length of board for the side, oh, one degree difference off a square over six foot will result in a one-and-a-half-inch gap at the end. Now, I don't care how good of a woodworker you think you are, wood putty is not going to cover that up. All right, a one and a half inch gap, you're not going to be able to hide with wood putty. It's just not going to happen, all right? And so it is. When it comes to where we place our trust in terms of our salvation, using a faulty measure will result in eternal judgment. That's why it is so important. And so Paul pleads with us here not to rely on anything other than knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, because that alone is of surpassing worth. But what does Paul mean when he says, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord? Let me tell you what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean simply having a head knowledge of who Jesus was is or was, devoid of any personal relationship with him. Rather, when he uses this word knowing, it means a deep, personal, and intimate, relational knowledge of a person. It is knowing them closely, personally, and, and it's having that, that, uh, that kind of continual and expanding understanding of the person. So, to merely acknowledge that a man named Jesus lived around 2,000 years ago in the uh, Roman province of Palestine, and, and he was a moralistic teacher, that's not enough. To even say that he was executed as an innocent man, even though he was the true epitome of innocence, that's not enough. To even say that he was raised from the dead and just know that in your head is not enough. Even to say that he was God is not enough. The Apostle James said, even the demons believe that and tremble. So at least they've got one up on the people who just have head knowledge of Jesus as God. They understand what that means. No, we can't have just head knowledge. You see, the Apostle Paul had head knowledge 
about who God was. He had lots of theological understanding and training. He knew that Messiah was coming. He knew all about Messiah. But what he lacked was the regenerated heart to receive the truth about who Messiah was in Jesus Christ until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And you know, sadly, there are many within the church today who have the head knowledge about who Jesus is, but they don't have that personal relationship with him. They could tell you anything you want to know about what the Bible says, but they don't have that relationship. Now, it's very easy for us sometimes to think, oh, well, yeah, okay, pastor's talking about all those liberal college professors at at these liberal Bible schools and seminaries who are on a quest to find the historical Jesus or, you know, who that man was before the Christian writers put all the myths on him in the Bible. Yeah, they meet that description. But brothers and sisters, there's a lot of folks in the pews of the church, in the local church today, who just have a head knowledge of Jesus. They just have a head knowledge of God. They don't have that heart relationship They don't know Jesus, as Paul said, that surpassing worth. No, we need to have that. We need to know him personally. After all, Paul uh, says that we need to know him as our Lord. He said, you know, uh, the worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, he doesn't leave that aspect of who Jesus was out of his description here. What does it mean? Knowing Christ as our Lord means submitting ourselves in every way to him, in every thought, in every word, in every action. There aren't any areas of our life that are our own anymore. When Jesus is our Savior, when Jesus is our Lord, he has full control over us. We belong to him And when the church knows Christ as Lord, there is unity and joy in the body because it is then submitting to the head of the body. When the head says that he wants it to go somewhere, the body moves in unison to go where the head says. Or when the head says to do something, the body moves in unison to do it. There's unity and joy in following Christ as Lord. So then, for unity and joy to thrive in the body of Christ, there must be a rejection of worldly righteousness, a counting of everything as loss and as rubbish in order that we might gain Christ. And that brings us to the second point that we should see this morning in what Paul writes, and that is the reception of of Christ's righteousness. Look at verse 9. He says, uh, and, uh, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. In order for us to stand justified before God, in order for us to stand in his presence, we must be righteous. Because God is a holy God. God is perfectly just and holy. He cannot allow sin into his presence. And we are, in our flesh, sinful creatures, right? All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And so we have to have some kind of righteousness then. If he can't allow sin in his presence, we have a monumental problem, don't we? We can't go before God. So we've got to figure something out here. Well, thanks be to God, we don't have to stay at this impasse anymore because he sent Jesus Christ to be our righteousness. He did what we could not. He lived that life that perfectly fulfilled the law. You see, it wasn't just that Christ kept the law. He fulfilled the law. He completed the law. And the great thing about this is that when our faith is placed in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us. It's credited to us. That's amazing. And so the righteousness of Christ is superior to the world's righteousness. 
There's nothing, there's no comparison here. You see, the fundamental problem with trying to base your righteousness on the world standards is that you're going to be building your house on shifting sand. The world standards are not based on the eternal values of God's word, the eternal values of God himself, right? They're on whatever the prevailing winds of the societal norms are right now. And that changes all the time. Now, if you're younger here today, you may not notice this as much. But if you're just middle-aged, let me ask you a question. Are the standards of the world today the same as what they were when you were a kid growing up? No, not even close. And for those of you who may be past middle age a little bit, you know that that's changed even more today. What we expect today in the world is very different than what just a few decades ago uh, was expected. Uh, that's just how it is. We change. This, this is constantly shifting in this way. And, and if you hold on to those old standards, right? Let's say that you're trying to hold on to the standards of your youth, the world standards. What happens? You get called the worst thing possible according to the world you're intolerant. You're intolerant. You don't accept the changing standards, the shifting standards at the world. But it's not only that the standards are shifting, they shift between and even within cultures, don't they? Think about this. Take our country as an example. Are the societal expectations in the American South the same as they are on the West Coast? Are the standards of righteousness the same? How about in New England? No, not at all. Some of us have lived in all of these different areas and we know that, that there is differences in what's expected even just within a single culture. But here, in contrast, Paul's saying the righteousness of Christ is the same today as it was yesterday as it will be tomorrow. It doesn't change. There's no shadow of change within God. What he expects and, and what his, his example of righteousness is in Jesus Christ remains the same. And in his immeasurable grace and love for us, he imputes that to us through faith. But not only is the righteousness of Christ superior to the world's righteousness, it's also superior to the law. And that's what Paul says here. He understood that in light of knowing Christ, the reliance he had on his own righteousness in the law was, was less than perfect. It was, it was rubbish. And, and he boasted, he would have boasted prior to knowing Christ, of his righteousness in the law. That's why he said earlier that uh, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's how he would have viewed himself. But this is the problem with trying to rely on the law for our righteousness. It always produces self-righteousness. Always. When you try to do it on your own, when you try to do it according to what you can do, it doesn't produce true righteousness according to God's standards. It produces self-righteousness, which is repugnant to God. Listen to what Gerald Hawthorne, who was a late professor of, of Greek at Wheaton College, he, he discussed Paul's argument for why Christ's righteousness was superior to the law, and he said this, if I try to earn God's favorable verdict by my own goodness, I am aiming at a righteousness of my own, one which is my own achievement and which will give me a claim on God's recognition. But as long as I am doing this, I disqualify myself from the true righteousness, which is not based on merit. You see, the Mosaic law was designed and was given to us to show us both the fullness of what God expected and to show us our inability to meet it. It was a tutor, it was a teacher in that regard. And, and its purpose has always been to drive us to a place where we place our faith in God alone for his righteousness. 
uh, the prophet Isaiah in 61.10 said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. You see, the righteousness that Isaiah received from God was not something that he earned. It was not something that he did by obeying the law. It was something that was given to him by God because of his faith, just as it was with all who are saved. Whether we try to establish our righteousness by the world standards or by some kind of self-keeping of the law, we destroy the unity and joy of the church because we are constantly trying to compete with one another. So Christ's righteousness then is superior, but how do we attain it? If Christ's righteousness is superior to the world's, world's definition of righteousness and it's, it's even superior to the law, then how do we attain Christ's righteousness? Well, Paul makes it very clear. It comes through faith in Christ alone. Listen again to what Hawthorne, as he, as he completes his thought that we began a few moments ago. He said, for faith is an admission that I cannot earn God's approval, but can only accept his free offer of forgiveness, grace, and love. And since the offer is made in the life and above all death of Christ, true righteousness, the condition of being truly right with God, must come through faith in Christ. You see, Paul has laid out two competing notions here. It is self-righteousness through achievement, or Christ's righteousness through imputation. That's it. Those are your only two options. And he's already said the first one you can't do. You can't earn your righteousness. There's nothing you can do that's going to be good enough to make up for your sin. So the only option you have is Christ's righteousness to rely on. And the only way that you can receive that is through faith. God giving it to you, imputing it to you through faith. That's your only choice. So for unity and joy to flourish within the life of the church, our faith must be in Christ alone and not in our own works. When we are relying more on what we do, on all of our works, then there will be competition, there will be comparison, and ultimately there will be contention within the church. So brothers and sisters, our righteousness, our justification was secured in the work of Christ. So let us count all the rest as rubbish for the sake of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and being found in his righteousness. Let us prefer the unity and joy of Christ's righteousness over anything that might be offered by the world because it is of surpassing worth far greater than anything that we can imagine. So in the rejection of worldly righteousness and in the reception of Christ's righteousness, Paul's purpose has been to know Christ more intimately. He wants to know Jesus on a deeper level. He wants to know him more. He wants to, to understand him more. He wants to love him more. And, and that goal is expressed twice here in this passage. He says he wants to know Christ a couple of times, and then he expands on it, and he, he says that uh, you know, he wants to gain Christ and be found in him because of his surpassing worth. Now in our last two verses today, in verses 10 and 11, Paul shows us what the ultimate goal was. Look with me here. He writes, "...that I may know him and the power of his resurrection." And may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's great hope is that through his faith in Jesus Christ, he might realize the resurrection. That is his goal. That is what he's going for. Now, is that because Paul is afraid to die? Is Paul so afraid of death that he's, oh, i got to know Jesus so that I don't have to die, that I can be raised up from the dead. No, not at all. Not at all. What Paul is saying here is that 
our resurrection, our glorification, that last step in our salvation is when we come to know Christ more fully than we ever could here on earth. And that's what he wants. No longer are we going to be looking in a mirror dimly. Now we're going to see clearly. In fact, when we get to heaven, when we attain that, our eyes are going to be open, truly opened for the first time. And we are going to behold the Lamb of God who loved us so much that he came and died for you and for me. That he bore the wrath of God that you and I deserve to bear because of our sin. He took it on himself freely so that we could be reconciled to God. Earlier, Paul had called all the things of this world rubbish. He said they're garbage. And now he's saying, look at what the goal of my life is. If you don't believe me that all of this is rubbish, my life is, is only counted that I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Why? So that I can know him even better. So that I can know him more perfectly. You know, in the resurrection, there is a tremendous joy for the believer. There is an amazing joy. Now, we're approaching the Easter season, right? We're approaching Easter Sunday, and that's the one Sunday that we set aside that we celebrate explicitly the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and we should. We should celebrate that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. But what I am saying is that the joy of the resurrection should be with us every day, not just one Sunday a year. We shouldn't just be joyful because it's Easter once a year. We should be joyful every day because Jesus has rose from the dead. If you have placed your faith in Christ as your Savior and Lord... You have not done so simply because Jesus was a moralistic teacher who said some things that you thought sounded pretty good. He said, love your neighbors and take care of the poor. And you said, yeah, that sounds really good. I like that. That appeals to my morals and my ethics. So, so Jesus is my Lord and Savior. There's been lots of moralistic teachers through the years, right? Right? There's been plenty. There's, there's uh, Socrates, there's, there's Aristotle, there's, there's um, uh, Zoroaster, there's Muhammad, there's Buddha, all these moralistic teachers. But they are different from Christ. You didn't place your faith in Christ just because he, he taught some nice things. You also did not place your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord because he was an innocent man who was executed falsely. You didn't do that. And you did not place your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord because it sounded like a good idea at the time or because all the cool kids were doing it or because society forced you to do it. No, you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord because the Holy Spirit regenerated your heart and made you open to the truth and the power of his resurrection. That is why you accepted him as your, your Lord and Savior. You see, all those other religious teachers, all those other moralistic teachers that we talked about, they all have one thing in common. They're dead. They're still in the ground. None of them have been raised again. But Jesus Christ has. He has been raised again. He is the resurrection and those of us who have placed our faith in him also will attain the resurrection. Are you excited? Are you joyful about the resurrection, brothers and sisters? Amen. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, I think so. Yes, it is okay to be excited about that. Have you considered that one of the... Listen, if, if, if you're not excited about the resurrection and you're a believer, how in the world do you face the challenges and the trials of this life? How do you? If you don't have the joy of the resurrection, you can't. 
Because what happens is we face them because we recognize that the reason we go through them, the reason we endure the sufferings, and, and Paul says we're going to have sufferings, right? We may share in his sufferings. We're going to have them. But the reason we have them is so that we can demonstrate to the world the power of his resurrection. Listen, if you're going through trials and all you do is complain and moan and throw yourself a pity party, you are no different than every other non-believer out there in the world. There is no difference. But when you approach the trials of your life with joy, with thankfulness, there's something different about you. And people want to know. You are becoming like Christ in his death. Now, I am not saying that through your suffering, you somehow have some kind of saving power, okay? That's what we would call a blasphemous heresy. We, we're not saying that. But what I am saying is that you are demonstrating the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You're being identified with him through how you handle the suffering that you face and the joy you see, we can be joyful not because suffering is fun, but because suffering won't last. This suffering will end, and we will have the resurrection. We will one day rise to meet him, and not only will we have the joy of rising to meet him, we have the joy and the privilege today of being able to tell others about him. Now, in the resurrection, there's also tremendous peace for the believer. You see, the final outcome is secure, brothers and sisters. It's secure. Christ has attained victory for us, and through our faith in him, we share in that victory. We don't need to worry about what tomorrow might hold for us because the absolute worst the world can do to us does not affect our ultimate disposition. It doesn't change what the final end result is. When we've received the righteousness of Christ through faith in him, and we know that the power of his resurrection on that first Easter Sunday means that he returns in power and glory, we too will experience the resurrection of the saints. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He said, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Praise God. In light of the glorious promise of the resurrection, how can we not have peace? How can we not have peace? This morning, I want to let you know that peace is available to you. It's available to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been listening to this and you're like, wow, how can anybody prefer that? How can anybody prefer suffering? How can anybody prefer getting rid of everything that the world has to offer and not counting it as what is important? How can anybody do that? Well, listen, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it just because you don't like it. You do it through the power of Jesus Christ. And, and that is an offer that he makes to you this morning. Salvation through faith in Christ alone, by faith alone. And it comes through God's grace alone. That's it. And so if you don't know Jesus, if you want to talk about having this kind of joy and peace this morning, I'm going to be right down here 
at the bottom of the stairs like I am every Sunday, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that. I'd like to be able to tell you about Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross and in the resurrection. I want to tell you how you can be reconciled to God, how all of those sins can be forgiven, and how you can have eternal life. I want to tell you about that. And if you're a believer this morning, and you're struggling with having that kind of joy, if you're struggling with preferring Christ over the world, I want to tell you, there's help, and the help comes in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that he would give us the Spirit as a helper to teach us, to help us to know these things, to help us to live out, to have the power by which we can live these things out. Again, we can't do it, even those of us who have placed our faith in Christ. We still can't do it on our own. We have to have the Holy Spirit's power in us. And I think one of the, one of the sad things is sometimes uh, we see the abuses of the Holy Spirit among some churches, and so some of us want to draw back, and we deny the Holy Spirit completely. Brothers and sisters, that's just equally as wrong. We need to be Holy Spirit empowered to meet the challenges of this world. So if you want to talk about that today, if you're a believer, you want to talk about uh, tapping into the Holy Spirit's power to, to prefer Christ and to seek after him above all else and to take your eyes off of the things of this world, I'd like to talk to you about that this morning too. And I'll, I'll be right down here after we pray and dismiss. So, so will you join me in prayer? Gracious Lord, we are just in awe of who you are. Father, you are amazing. We sang to you this morning, holy, 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 because that is who you are. We, we long for the day when you return, when you call us home, and when you make all things right here in your creation. Father, when sin and death are ultimately defeated, we know the defeat was at Calvary. We know that when Christ rose on the third day, that there was defeat, but we still have the remnants of it here waiting for you to return. And so, Father, our hearts cry out, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Father, we want to be able to choose you above all else. We want to say to all of those competing things in our lives that they are rubbish. So, Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come and to fill us and to give us the ability to seek after you more deeply, more intimately, more personally, so that you can transform us, so that you can turn us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. You may sanctify us. Father, I thank you that you have promised to do just that. Father, if there's anyone here this morning, though, who doesn't know you through your son, Jesus, I pray that you bring them down to speak to me. Father, draw them to yourself so that we might be able to share the gospel with them and be able to proclaim the good news. We don't need a good teacher. We need good news, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's plenty of good teachers out there. There's plenty of people that will tell you how to fix yourself, and all of them will fail. Father, we need to hear the word of how you, through Jesus Christ, will fix us by regenerating our hearts and by saving us. So, Father, I want to be able to share that this morning. Father, we do ask you to go with us as we depart from here. Father, help to keep us unified as the body, even if we're not together in the church building. But, Father, help us to remain unified and joyful in the world, calling on one another, lifting one another up in prayer, encouraging one another, admonishing one another when necessary. And, Father, to love one another and continue to spur one another on to good works. 
so that we may proclaim your grace until you return. And we'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.